Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath day. Greetings to those on the internet or those that might be watching live. We hope you enjoy the messages that go uh, from the congregation. Today's message is entitled His Body on Earth. And we're going to discuss uh, some scriptures concerning us being His body. And um, also that uh, there might be a, a, a dual interpretation of being His body. And also we'll get into some uh, descriptions of what his body looks like. How do we know that we are his body? And um, I'm not going to go there, but uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, discusses us being one body. And this theme is also repeated in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is where I'm going to start off. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Messiah. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So, this is a repetitious theme throughout Scripture that all peoples from different backgrounds are coming together into one by one spirit. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. This word member uh, means appendages, parts. Um, the hand is a member of the body. The foot is a member of the body. Verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am, I am not of the body, is it therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now it has, excuse me, but now has Yahweh set the members, every one of them in the body as it pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body? That I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but Yahweh has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schisms in the body. That word schisms means divisions. But that the members should have the same care one of another. And keeping this, this uh, message, this thought in mind that we're one body, opens up a huge discussion when people out there in the mainstream want to ask us what denomination we are or, uh, you know, what church do we go to? And I, I really, if I got a few minutes to sit down and they, they say, what denomination are you? And I say, what verse are you referring to when it talks about denomination? Uh, well, what church do you go to? Well, the Bible says that I am the church. We are the church. Well, you know, who do you, who do you fellowship with? Uh, people that follow Yeshua. Um, the Bible says that we're all one and there's not supposed to be schisms. There's not supposed to be divisions. So how does that line up with thousands and thousands of, of different beliefs and different interpretations about the one book, the one Savior? Uh, <clears throat> verse 26. And whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are all the body of Messiah and members in particular. And Yahweh has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healings. Do all speak with tongues. Do all interpret. But covet earnestly the best gifts. 
and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And I believe the more excellent way that he was referring to is the following chapter. Let everything be done with love. And he goes on to say that, uh, you know, no matter what you do, if you don't do it with love, it's nothing. In Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible L, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead and that in all things he might have the preeminence it says that the messiah is the head of the body which is the church the church is the body and he's the head of it and after I, before I did this study, in my mind, before I researched this, in my mind, he's the head, and we are the body parts walking around on earth. Some of us are hands, and some of us are feet, and, you know, whatever. We have different roles within the body. But as I researched this, I was like, wow, it's, it's, there's more to it than that. Uh, we'll get into that here in, in just a minute. In verse... Uh, Verse 24 of the same chapter. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Messiah in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. His body is the church. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Chapter 2 of verse, excuse me, chapter 2 of Ephesians. Uh, we spent, uh, we've spent a lot of time in Ephesians. I normally start off in verse 11 about the reconciliation of the nations, the Gentiles, how they are made into one, both groups, both Israelite and those of the nations being brought together into one. But I'm going to pick up in verse 16, now that we know the context, and that he might reconcile both unto El, both to Yahweh, in one body, by the cross or the torture stake, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. We both, meaning those of Israel and those outside of covenant who are being brought into covenant. We both, both groups of people, have access to the Father by one spirit. Verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of Yahweh. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yeshua Messiah being the chief cornerstone. We are being built into a habitation. Actually, it goes on to say that. But that was another thing, that we are his temple. We are his presence here on earth. And uh, that that ties in with being his body, but it actually goes off into a, a few uh, more verses we'll get into in just a few minutes. Verse 20 says, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. See, a lot of people in the mainstream, their foundation is only a misinterpretation of the apostles. They don't push away the prophets. But a true foundation is the apostles and the prophets, uh, and Yeshua the Messiah being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you also are built together for a habitation, a dwelling place of Yahweh through the Spirit. 
chapter 3 of Ephesians, uh, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Messiah, which in other ages was not known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, the nations, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Messiah by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one master, one faith, one baptism, one Elohim and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Uh, verse 11 of chapter 4. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Messiah. Now, I, I went a little deeper into that verse there. That word perfecting means complete furnishing, equipping. The reason he put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is for the equipping or the fully furnishing of the saints. Why? For the work of ministry. That word Work is the labor. That word ministry is service. For the labor of service. For the edifying of the body of Messiah. Edifying is to build up. It's an architectural term uh, concerning structure. To, to build up a structure. Um, so the, the reason he put people... In, in place, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the body to do the work of ministry. And we're gonna we're gonna continue on to read what that body is supposed to be doing on earth. Um, everybody has a part in the work of ministry, the body. In uh, verse thirteen, actually, you know that thought kind of flows. Um, Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. And in verse 13, till we all come into the unity of the faith. And it's quite possible that the unity of the faith refers to the Messiah's return. And of the knowledge of the Son of El unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Messiah, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And ladies and gentlemen, if you spend just a few minutes on any social media uh, venue, you will find many people being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine torn apart and divided over some of the silliest, most trivial things and causing wedges of division over every nook and cranny of the Bible that you could possibly think of. And it's sad because the scriptures we read say there's one body, there's one foundation. You can't lay any other foundation. And, uh, you know, a lot of things are in my opinion just aren't worth dividing and, and fighting over especially when you have commentary after commentary after commentary going in both directions and you sometimes you just have to go with what you feel is right but sometimes you're just not going to know until Messiah returns and tells you for himself from his own mouth uh, Ephesians chapter 5 And verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the master. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Messiah is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So here, his body is uh, referenced as the wife. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Messiah, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and, sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the master of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning the Messiah and the church. Uh, this verse that's quoted from Genesis about a man leaving his father and mother and being joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Paul says that this is a mystery concerning the Messiah. That verse is a mystery about the Messiah. And I believe that he left his father from heaven. He left his mother from earth and he is cleaving, becoming one with his body, the church. Um, verse uh, 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Um, concerning us being his body, the temple, John chapter 2, the gospel of John chapter 2, and verse 16, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? Yeshua answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. The reason I came to this verse is this verse says that his body is his temple, and we're going to find through Scripture that we are his body and his temple. So these things, uh, you know, were an allegory of us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 4. To whom coming as unto a lively, a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of Yahweh and precious, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua Messiah. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumbled at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So what are some identifying marks of us being his body, being his temple, being his bride, his, uh, his church on earth? Uh, John chapter 13. I just have a few verses that I'm just going to skip, skip around on a couple of verses, but the first one is John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. You can tell by the way his people treat each other, whether they're truly in him. 
And, uh, you know, I went to a, a fellowship in uh, Tennessee not long ago, and I noticed that when the men came in, just about everyone hugged every single man in the fellowship. And, uh, and that was something that just stood out to me. Even, uh, like, one person would come in, and he would go, and he would hug every man. And, you know, he'd hug a couple of women, too. But I just noticed that there was like a – a strong embrace between the men. It looked like they haven't seen each other in ages. I was like, wow, these guys love each other. But, uh, you know, that's that's the type of love that we should have for one another. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. It says that our love for each other is supposed to be the same as the love he has given to us. And if you think about that, he, uh, in um, Romans chapter 5, it says he proved his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And it says that he died for the wicked. Unconditional, unwavering love is what the Messiah, seeing through our imperfection and loving us anyway, that is the type of love we should have for one another. Romans chapter 13 and verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For that he that loves another hath fulfilled the law. Now the mainstream interprets that, well, if you have love, you don't need to keep the law. But what that's actually saying is if you love, you have, fulfilled, you have found the completion of the law because all of the law is geared towards loving him and loving our neighbor. That's why when they said, what's the greatest? The the Hallelujah. Uh, the, uh, somebody said, what's the greatest law? He said, to love Yahweh with all your heart, mind, and soul. The second like unto it is to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hangs all the law and the prophets. Because all of the law and the prophets is a, com uh, a, a commentary on how to keep those two. So if you love, you are fulfilling it. You are completing it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says, I therefore, the prisoner of Yahweh, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That word forbearing means putting up with. We need to put up with our brothers and sisters in the faith with love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's how we stay in unity, by staying peaceful with one another. So, a few more identifying marks of being his body. We see uh, in, the, in Matthew chapter 25, he's going to separate his body out from the rest. In Matthew 25 and verse 33, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, the shepherd is going to set apart his sheep. But the goats on the left, goats are stubborn. I promise you that. Verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Master, when did we see you hungry, and fed you thirsty, and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and took you in, naked, and clothed you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. His flock that is being separate out took care of people and loved people. And he's saying, when you showed this love, you were doing it to me. In uh, Matthew chapter 19, as his body, we have a hope that we're looking for. And that hope is eternal life with him when sickness and death, disease and tears are no more. And somebody asked him how they could inherit that in Matthew 19, 16. 
And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What is the good thing that I can do to have everlasting life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is Yahweh. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Hmm. Now, some in the past have wanted to keep the commandments, the commandments externally, and they trusted in their works. They thought that their righteousness came by their own works of the law. But if we fulfill the law, we will find that the end result is love. So by him saying, keep the commandments, if he truly kept the commandments, he would have love because that is what the commandments are geared toward. But he goes on and said, he says unto him, which? Yeshua said, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you're doing these things, that's the evidence that you love your neighbor. Because you would not do these things against your neighbor if you loved him. Verse 19, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What do I lack? Yeshua saith unto him, if you will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So that shows two things he was missing out on. One was where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and also loving the poor. He was missing something. Now this doesn't mean that you can't have riches. And he goes on to explain that in verse... Um, uh, Verse 23, then said Yeshua unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Yeshua beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with Yahweh, all things are possible. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in many, many uh, righteous men in the past have had riches, but they used them for Yahweh's glory and for the kingdom. And uh, in order, uh, there's a, a verse that says, you know, working with your own hands that you may have to bless other people. You have to have things to bless other people with those things. Um, verse uh, Luke chapter 6 a lot of people they believe that they're his body they believe that he is their master but the scriptures give us evidence that many people will call him master and won't enter in in Luke chapter 6 verse 46 and why call you me master master and don't do the things which I say Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which builds a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the, when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately fell and the ruin of that house was great. He says, why do you call me master and don't do the things that I say? And if you hear his words, but you don't do it, you're like a house that's going to collapse that doesn't have a foundation. In verse, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, there's another group calling him master. 
721 of Matthew says, Not everyone that says unto me, Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Yes. We need to ask ourselves, where do we find his will? His will is his word. His will is manifested to us in his word. But so now I must ask all of these people out there that claim to be his followers that do away with 80% of the book. How do they know what his will is? Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And many of you know that that word iniquity means lawlessness. It's living without law which is manifested in his word, his instructions. So how do we come to, what, what, else, are, what's a, what else is an identifying mark of being part of his body? We see, we've read numerous things on, on what's going to divide us and what's not going to get us into the kingdom and he, what's going to get us eternal life. In Romans chapter 8, it says uh, in verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love Yahweh, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. We have been called to bear his image. And it says, there's another verse that says, we're changed into his image from glory to glory. And I've done, you know, extensive messages on getting rid of the old nature and taking on the new nature. And that new nature is his image, his character, his love. It's death of self while allowing him to live through us. And I'm going to close out with Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Um, and I'm just going to briefly quote a verse from Galatians chapter 5. It says, If you're in Messiah, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and lust. That is the goal of us as believers in living victorious now is conquering, subduing, and getting mastery over this flesh and causing it to obey us while also causing our thoughts to obey us. When those negative thoughts come, when those uh, evil thoughts come, we take that thought captive and make our minds obey us through the power of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Messiah. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Messiah lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Yahweh who loved me and gave himself for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to ask ourselves, is the Messiah living in us, and is that the image we are projecting to the world? Hallelujah.